So you've installed Trace Boss and you're having fun, you're making measurements, and you're wondering now what is the next level. So let's make a simulated measurement here and get some data on the screen. So some next level kinds of things involve exploring your data a little further. Currently on my screen, I have Trace Boss as it first installs. Now these settings may not be what you're used to. For example, Trace Boss installs as metric. These are micrometers, not micro inches. Now that's a vertical scale right there, so we're going to go to scaling and choose imperial instead of metric. Now I can choose imperial and I have now 400 millionths plus or minus on my scale. That may not be great for your particular surface. Now I went to scaling last time to change that, but we can also do a shortcut. If there's something you don't like, like the scaling, we can double click on the scaling and go directly to it. So let's go 200 to 400 and maybe that looks a little better for our surface. But we can change the scaling to see what's going on. Now, looking around the screen, there are some other things that are hiding. There's a little gear here for settings regarding which profile graph I want to show. If I click settings and say measured or direct, direct means directly off the gauge, I'll see something like this. It was a little bit tilted and it wasn't quite zeroed. That's okay, that's typical of a measuring gauge. We never land exactly at zero, but that's the measured surface. Once we level that surface, we have the primary profile, and then we put a waviness filter through the primary profile to do a standard roughness analysis. The filtering is down here. You can check out Digital Metrology's notepad videos regarding filtering and waviness, but our goal in roughness measurement is to start with our measured profile and then level it and then find the waviness and ultimately remove that waviness to show the roughness. So the roughness is flattened out. There's no more waviness present. Now on the screen, we have the roughness profile, and currently I have a material probability graph. You might be more interested in just the standard material ratio, or maybe the material ratio with the RK analysis. The RK shows red for peaks and blue for the valleys. I'm going to change the scale again. I'm going to double click on my scale and make it 100 to perhaps 200. Now if I make a mistake and say 100, 200, the software will remind me. Convert the minimum to negative? Yes, I'd like the minimum, the bottom number to be negative. And now I have a nice view of this simulated data. I can see a little red zone for my RPK, and I can see a blue zone for my RVK. But the middle of the surface, the RK, is still kind of this white region. Now while we're here, let's talk about colors. This screen is the black mode, which many people are, are liking right now, but in some settings we might want to go to the settings and choose the other color scheme. If I click color scheme, it takes us to the light color scheme, and perhaps this looks better in your environment. Now in this case, the roughness profile is a nice dark blue, and if I show it by itself, this is what we see. And if we turn on the analysis zones, we can see the pink and blue for the, the peaks and the valleys, or the RPK and the RVK. So, a little bit on exploring. Now, people are using the RK and RPK parameters, RVK, quite commonly in plateau honing. But as we get into extremely plateaued surfaces, we might want to take a peek at this curve and kind of look for the knee, or perhaps switch to the material probability curve. Now this is a curve that shows kind of statistically how the peaks and the valleys interact. There's going to be a straight line for the peaks and a straight line for the valleys if we become extremely plateaued. Now always I want to encourage you to go to the help system. The Trace Boss help system talks about profiles and curves. So here's a profile and here's a curve. If we go to the profiles and curves section and click on the profile graph, it talks us through the things we just saw. And if we go to the material ratio and material probability curve, it talks about how the curve is generated. We're slicing to 
plot the amount of material. And then it talks about the probability graph. The probability graph is based on statistics that look for the rough honed surface and make a line and looks for the plateau and makes a line. And when we have both of those processes present, we'll see two lines on this curve. Now this particular curve, I can also add the analysis. So material probability with analysis puts the lines on it, just like material ratio versus material ratio with analysis puts the lines on it. So we can see the, the bear curve to kind of get a, a visual of the curve itself and then see what the RK parameters do. Similarly, we can look at the material probability curve and see what the probability lines look like. Sometimes as we're developing a process, these lines don't land where we think they should. Maybe our surface isn't very plateaued and the mathematics are doing its very best. In fact, the math is based on an international standard for how to find these lines, but sometimes we might want to override this. In this case, we can adjust them by hand. We can adjust this RQ family by hand, I can open this window and use the cursors and say, I really think the valleys are down here and the peaks may extend a little farther down here. And I can recalculate using the cursor regions instead of the automatic standard method. So if I recalculate with the cursor regions, let's watch these lines move. And they adjusted a little bit and they turned pink. The pink lines tell me that they are manual <clears throat> and not standard, but that's okay. When we're developing a process, we can sometimes do better than the standard. Now, when I did this, my parameters, my RPQ changed. It's now eight micro inches instead of the seven. RVQ changed. My material ratio, RMQ, where the peaks meet the valleys, changed a little bit. It went up to 89 instead of 86. I can adjust these and find the best region that feels like these are my valleys and these are my peaks and use the cursor regions to calculate. I can always go back and calculate automatic if I want. But if I like this, I've chosen this, I can click OK. These numbers are going to now move to the main screen. So my new numbers are on the main screen and my lines are now red or pink to indicate that this was a manual override. So that's the kind of the front end, the screen itself. Now there are some things we can do in settings. By the way, in material probability, we just have peaks and valleys. So the valleys are blue when we show the profile with analysis. Whereas with RK, we get three zones, peaks, valleys, and then the core, the kernel. Let's switch over to settings and talk about some things that might be scary. In previous videos, we talked about choosing our gauge. We're gonna use a simulated gauge for now. We also need to understand this idea of length and filters. Now I would point you to the help system or to the digital metrology notepad series, but here's a quick tip. If you're in doubt and if you're measuring just standard surfaces, a camshaft or a, you know some, some land on a, a gasketed surface or something, you're just doing a standard roughness analysis, click the standard defaults. If I click the standard defaults, the settings will change to a standard roughness measurement. A standard roughness measurement uses a Gaussian filter and imperial units will use a 30 thou cutoff and a 300 to one bandwidth. And the tracing length is set up with six samples and we're gonna discard the edges because it's a Gaussian filter. So if all of those things are scary, think about, are we, am I measuring a standard surface, a valve guide, a uh, crankshaft feature, or am I measuring a plateau? When we measure a plateau, we click over to the plateau defaults, and it's going to make a longer measurement. We need more length in order to see the valleys in the surface. When we make plateaus, the valleys are sometimes wide or far apart, and we need more length to become reliable. So the plateau defaults will take us to a longer length and a robust filter because robust filtering is needed so we don't fool ourselves in the plateau. Again, hit the notepad series video on robust filtering on digitalmetrology.com for more of that.
Now we can also set up tolerances here. I know we love to bash on RA, so let's set an upper limit of eight millionths of an inch on RA. If I have an upper limit of eight millionths of an inch on RA, the screen will show me when I go out of tolerance. So let's okay these settings and we'll see that RA now turned red. We can set up tolerances for our parameters in the settings screen. Now these tolerances may be different for say semi-finish versus finish, and in that case it might be useful to use the save settings button. I can set up this screen however I want. I can set up my lengths, I can choose a user length, I can set my filtering, I can set my color, screen, color scheme, I can tell the system where to send the results if I want to shoot SPC data or historical data out to a spreadsheet. I can set all of this up and then I can click Save Settings and now I can save these settings to a settings file. For example, this might be Trace Boss settings for my semi-finish process process. And I can save those and later I can reload those semi-finish settings or I can save dozens of different settings files depending on my application. So settings is where we're going to kind of do the heart of the math and usually we set it and forget it. Now anything I set up on the screen when I leave the software the last thing I did will show up the next time I open the program. So I'm going to reopen Trace Boss, and those same settings are back now. It remembered those settings that I had, so I can continue where I left off. So there are a lot of things under the cover with Trace Boss. I'm going to leave you with a couple of fun ones. Trace Boss has a spot for a picture, kind of telling the person making the measurements where to measure. This is in settings. And there'll be a little example um, thumbnail of the current image. I can click on that and choose my own image file. Now, depending on the size of your screen, if the screen is too small or the resolution is too small, that picture goes away. So some low resolution screens won't see that. I'm on a 1080p screen and there's room for that picture to show up. So the picture is kind of fun. We can save that image. It goes right into our settings. So we can have different pictures for different settings files. The last thing I want to leave you with, which is kind of fun also, is the logo and the heading. I mentioned if you don't like something, double click it. So if I don't like anything in the heading, I can double click the heading and I can change my identification. I can say this is a uh, cast iron bore and middle location so I know where I measured it. So I can choose the identification for my data and I can even choose a company logo and my company name. So a logo can be any file on your computer and the company name can be any text you want to enter here and we'll call this my company. And let's choose a logo. I don't know what image files I have on my desktop. Let's just grab something. Uh, let's see what I've got here that might be fun. Oh, here's a picture of uh, a gauge. So we'll grab that gauge picture. And that becomes my company logo. And over here it says my company for the name. So we can configure Trace Boss to do some things that are unique to your application. Now, in fact, I can print this screen to a PDF right now. And that screen that I have in front of me will be printing here. And I have this exactly as I configured it on my system. So the last thing I want to talk about is saving and reloading data. This measurement that we made, in fact, the raw measured data right here can get saved out to your computer. It can be sent to your customers, whatever you need. It's important to know that we always save raw data. So any settings can be recreated or changed. So this measurement right here on the screen, I'm going to save it. I'll save it to my desktop and I'll call it Trace Boss Data Wall 1 and save that to the desktop. Now that data that I just saved to the desktop is a file right here. If I make more measurements, I'll see new data on the screen. But here's my one that I just, my file that I just saved. I can always drag him back in 
or I could do a file open and then go find that file on my desktop as well. So this ability to save data is important. If you have questions with your data, email that data file to me or to someone who's helping with your surfaces or even to a customer that wants to know what their surface looked like. Perhaps you're machining for somebody and they want to see the actual data. You can send them the data file and then they can open up TraceBoss and drag it in and see it for themselves. So those are some basics and perhaps even a little bit advanced at times, but to get you started in TraceBoss and help you see some of the things you can do inside the software. If you have questions, reach out to us at digitalmetrology.com. We're super happy to help. This is fun stuff, and I hope you enjoy learning and seeing your surfaces in a different way with TraceBoss.